Good morning, everyone. My name is Jeremy Rutledge, and I'm senior pastor at Circular Congregational Church, and it is my delight to welcome you to our online morning worship service on this beautiful, almost spring morning here in the Low Country. And we say in the spirit of our progressive and inclusive faith that whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey this morning, you are welcome here. And we're glad that you're here. Um, often we pass a word of peace at this time in that welcoming spirit, but today is the first Sunday of the month, and so we share communion on the first Sunday. And when we do that, which is toward the end of our service, there will be a moment when we're invited to pass the peace. So now I think we have a brief announcement or two as we gather ourselves. Good morning. My name is Kayan Yanahowski, and I'm currently serving as the Circular Church Congregational President. I would like to remind everyone that we are in conversation regarding the Circular Church digital streaming project. That project design plan and FAQs were sent out to the congregation about two weeks ago for everyone's review. Last week we held a congregational Q&A session on Sunday and Wednesday, and that was an opportunity for everyone to come together and discuss concerns and other questions that they may have. Those sessions were recorded and are available upon request. If you'd like to review them, just contact the church office and you can listen in and see how those conversations went. The FAQ document that was sent out has been updated with questions that came out of those conversations. The design plan, the FAQ document, and the formal request for congregational affirmation have been sent out to the congregation. Please review the design plan and the FAQs, and if you have not had a chance to vote, voting is open until Tuesday, March the 9th at midnight. We look forward to hearing from you. Thanks. And now that we've gathered ourselves and shared an announcement or two, I invite you to join me in taking a breath together and grounding ourselves for this hour of worship. As I ring this bowl, let's remember all who have gone before us. Let's give thanks for this day. Let's feel the tie that binds us and join our hearts in worship together. Good morning. I'm Conway Saylor. We're so glad you're here joining us virtually. And I want to invite you to join me in the call to worship written by Jeremy Rutledge. We gather for worship in a spirit of reverence. We recognize the light in all people. We see and feel the shining beauty of the earth. We dream of a new day of living peaceably with all. May this hour together kindle our spirits and strengthen our resolve. Amen. Hi, I'm Judy Hammett, the organist at Circular. Our hymn this morning is God the Omnipotent. We invite you to sing along with members of the choir. This is a bold hymn, so sing out boldly.
Chris, and this is the part of the service that's for kids of all ages. Now, I really like to cook and bake, and I'm not good, or extremely good, at least, at either of those things, but I do enjoy cooking and baking. And one of the first places that I got to share my talents with a large group was many years ago at one of my older churches. And this church was in a city that that did something very, very special. You see, during the winter, there were a lot of people who didn't have any place to go at night when it got cold. And so our church and many other churches would actually let people come in and they would sleep in the church overnight during the winter. And in the evening, we would serve them dinner and we would send them on their day in the morning with breakfast and with lunch. And we did something very interesting when we made them dinner. The person in charge made sure that as much as we could do was from scratch. We made hand-rolled meatballs, we baked cookies and other desserts from scratch, even the salad dressing was made from homemade recipes, we peeled the potatoes for the mashed potatoes and made the meatloaf and pasta and all sorts of things. And you know what, when people came in and they got their food and they sat down to eat it, they were so happy. They were so happy. You could see the looks on their faces. And you know why? Because they were eating homemade, handmade food. And you all know the difference that when you eat, let's say, a cookie that's homemade, there is something very special in that cookie or anything else that's homemade that you don't get when it comes from a store or when it comes from a frozen package. Because what you're getting is that little piece of magic that we call that heart and that soul that goes into it, that the person making it put into it. You know, today, during the service, we're going to be talking about peace. And I think that one of the ways that we can build a world with peace is by putting that extra little bit of effort into every action that we do. I mean, when you do something for someone that's nice, and you do it just because they have to, or just because you're expected to do something, there's something very different when you do something nice because you love that person, because you respect that person, because you care about them. Because when you put that love and respect and that care into your actions, then you're transferring that love and respect on care onto that other person. So if we want to make a happier, more joyful, peaceful world, then we need to put love and care and that heart and soul into each and every one of our actions. Please pray with me. Dear God, help us to fill every action that we do with our heart and with our soul to make the world a more peaceful place. Amen. As we join in a prayer of confession, I want to invite you to reflect with me on what peace means in the context of our personal lives, our community, and the larger world. In my time as a psychologist, I spent a lot of time thinking about stress and bullying and ostracism mostly in children, but the same dynamics hold in us adults. The same pattern emerges over and over again. Those who engage in acts of hostility toward one another, whether it's the targets, the observers, or the perpetrators, suffer negative impacts on our health and well-being. Those who harbor hatred and act out in violent ways, however justified, suffer negative consequences physically, emotionally, and spiritually. As followers of Jesus, how do we advocate for justice and not compromise the priorities of peace and love for our neighbors, even those who offend us or show cruelty to others? As we pray, let us confess our daily struggles with this challenge and ask for guidance and strength to practice peace. Dear God, we confess that we are easily drawn to conflict and outrage 
even when it means embracing the toxic ways of the world rather than the peace offered by and modeled by Jesus. Help us to gird ourselves for each day's stresses by practicing kindness, calm, gratitude, and love for others. Help us to not be seduced by the transient buzz of righteous indignation, of bitterness and rage, or of landing the sharp jab intended to and successful at hurting others. Help us each to develop into the strong but peaceful people you intended your followers to be, as expressed so beautifully by St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. Amen. Hello, I'm Anara Gorman, and I'll be doing today's scripture reading. 1 Corinthians 18 through 25 from the Inclusive Bible. For the message of the cross is complete absurdity to those who are headed for ruin. But to us who are experiencing salvation, it is the power of God. Scripture says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and thwart the learning of the learned. Where are the wise? 
Where are the scholars? Where are the philosophers of this age? Has not God turned the wisdom of this world into folly? If it was God's wisdom that the world in its wisdom would not know God, it was because God wanted to save those who have faith through the foolishness of the message we preach. For while the Jews call for miracles and the Greeks look for wisdom, here we are preaching a Messiah nailed to a cross. To the Jews, this is an obstacle they cannot get over. And to the Greeks, it is madness. But to those who have been called, whether they are Jews or Greeks, Christ is the power and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. May we hear the wisdom and the words. Thanks be to God. Good morning. As we think about peacemaking together, I'm returning to a favorite story. It contains um, something that's become a catchphrase in our family when we say, that's me, man. If you're a kid and you're listening, you can listen to this story and find out where that phrase comes from. It comes um, from a place I went once and met a number of peacemakers. It's in that spirit that I offer this. It's entitled, A Different Kind of Communion. It was a different kind of communion. I learned about it in my church history classes. Throughout thousands of years of Christian history, there were always a few. The way is nonviolence, they said. We will not take up the sword. I read all I could get. Anabaptists, free thinkers, early friends, commonly called Quakers, then Mennonites, Baptists, disciples, and others. Down through the ages, they formed a different kind of communion. They stood out from the rest of the Christian tradition for their unwillingness to go along with militarism. It was a different kind of communion. I found it my first year as a pastor. Our country was rushing to war in Iraq and most churches were silent. I began going to peace vigils, meeting the handful of other clergy and people of faith who sat holding candles at the fountains as trucks drove past and shouted threats. Visiting Sarah in Indiana, we marched with her Methodist church in the snow. Retired service members in uniform carried a banner, Veterans for Peace. The Friends Meeting in Houston opened its doors every day. Silent sunrise prayers for peace. It was beyond simply a Christian communion. Buddhists were there, Sikhs and Hindus, Muslims and Jews bearing witness together, and dear humanists too. Yet we were bound by being in the minority in our communities. Most people didn't march. Most people didn't speak. Most people went along with it as the bombs rolled off the, the assembly lines and the troops began shipping out. It was a different kind of communion then when my friend dropped me off at the encampment outside the president's ranch in Crawford, Texas. Gold Star mothers whose children had died in the war were holding vigil there. They were asking the president to come out and sit with them, hear their stories. He did not. But many of us did come from around the country. It felt like a pilgrimage. Here I was from Houston. There was someone from San Francisco. Someone else had come from Boston, another from Dallas. It was hot in the Texas sun, dangerously so, and I was sent to create a sign for the first aid tent. As I colored a great red cross onto a poster board, a man came and sat next to me. We began to talk. He asked where I was from, and I told him. I asked where he was from, and he said, Indiana. Indiana? 
I asked. By any chance, did you ever meet a guy named Carl Risingmore? No sooner had I asked than he began to smile and then laugh. Carl Risingmore? That's me, man. Carl Risingmore had been arrested years earlier while demonstrating against the war in Indianapolis. The peacenik community there had written him letters to keep his spirits up while he was in jail. I looked up from my work. Now I was smiling too. Hey, I wrote you letters while you were in jail. And then Carl's face changed. He was still smiling, but his eyes filled with emotion. Thanks, man, he said. For the rest of the day, Carl Risingmore and I moved through the encampment, passing out bottles of cold water. The temperature had soared above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and the threat of heat exhaustion was real. It felt like a different kind of communion. Take this. It is cold water that I give to you. Let us drink it to sustain ourselves on this hot day. I made the mistake of offering water to the Secret Service guys who were baking in their sedan. One of them stepped out of the car with his hand on a gun. We can't accept that, he said. Okay, I replied, but if you guys start to overheat, just let me know. I couldn't read his expression through the dark glasses he wore. He probably thought I was a fool. To try and follow the way of peace is to join a different kind of communion. It may put us at odds with much of our tradition and much of our culture, but that has always been the case. In his old letter to the church at Corinth, Paul, who had once been a very violent man himself, wrote that the way of Jesus was foolishness to the world. He was writing to a very cultured crowd. Corinth wasn't that far from Athens. It was a cosmopolitan city on the sea, home to a variety of philosophies and religions, yet Paul was offering something very different. The Christianity he was preaching sounded like foolishness because it was conventionally weak. Jesus had imagined a kingdom of heaven spread out on the earth made of the least and the lowest, the bruised and the brokenhearted. Add to this the idea that Jesus counseled laying down our swords, forgiving 70 times seven, and then seemingly marched right into his own death at the hands of an oppressive empire. And the whole thing was about as foolish as it could be. It was a different kind of communion based on a completely different set of values. There was little ego in it. There was no violence in its only force, to paraphrase the process thinker Alfred North Whitehead, its only force lay in the supreme power of its ideas. Jesus wasn't offering the force of arms. He was offering the force of imagination. Can you imagine a more peaceable world, he was asking. Can you see it? Can you embody it alongside me? Of course, most just saw this as foolishness. Today we are continuing to think together about our liberal theological tradition. As we have mentioned, when we use the word liberal in this context, we are not referring to American partisan politics, but to the religious movement that was begun around the turn of the 19th century by Friedrich Schleiermacher and others. If you'd like to hear more about that, just tune into the sermon from February 21st entitled Friedrich's Middle Path. One of the hallmarks of our liberal theological tradition, according to Gary Dorian, of Union Theological Seminary is our conception of Christianity as an ethical way of life and our favoring of moral concepts of the atonement. 
By this we mean that our religious tradition questions violent theologies. In particular, we have great difficulty with the idea that Jesus was a sacrifice to an angry God, that his innocent blood was required to be shed for us. Such a violent theology, inscribing bloodlust into the very heart of Christian faith, is something that many, if not most in the liberal tradition, firmly reject. Instead, we see Jesus' death not as a requirement or an appeasement, but rather a moral example of existential courage and love. Jesus was not shielding us from a vengeful God through his sacrifice. Jesus was showing us the way to live peaceably and without fear of our own mortality. Jesus' God was found in and through the different kind of communion he created with all who walked alongside him. His God was found in the breaking of bread, the inclusion of outcasts, the laying down of swords, the sharing of resources, and repeated radical acts of giving oneself away in service and love. Have we mentioned this was foolishness to the culture around him? Have we mentioned this remains foolishness in our own culture? It's more than foolishness, though. Jesus' way is a way of real tension. For while I remain committed to the way of peace, and most of us in our church do, we must also struggle with the fact that we have from time to time received violent threats ourselves. We even have a security person when we gather on Sundays who helps us watch out for the health and safety of the group. So even as we join in nonviolent movements through groups like our Charleston Area Justice Ministry and peaceable religious efforts in our United Church of Christ, we must also be mindful that we still live in a violent culture. The threats we have re received at Circular are related to the rainbow flag we hang on the fence and the public stands we have taken for acceptance and inclusion. There's a bitter irony in the fact that our loving stances provoke hate. But part of our faith is simply telling the truth about the struggle. In the liberal religious tradition, we struggle with the creative tension of learning the way of peace in a country that doesn't really value it, and in a time when violence and the threat of violence are actually real. We also struggle because this is a different kind of communion we are joining. To say that the way of Jesus is the way of peace is to make a transformative claim. For peace, as the great Zen teacher Thich Nhat Hanh says, is every step, it is every breath, it is every word, it is every choice. Peace is every bottle of water passed out on a hot day with a handful of people who have come from all over to bear witness against our warring ways. Oftentimes, when we take communion at church, I think of those friends in the Texas sun. What foolishness, I think. Thank God. Amen.
Friends, now is the time when we collect the offering with a word of gratitude for all that is given so generously. Everything that we receive is used to support our church, which is a house of welcome for all people. And it's also used to support our work for justice and peace in the world outside our walls. I'd also like to remind you that we have a COVID-19 relief fund. And if you or someone you know in the community is really struggling uh, with financial hardship caused by this pandemic, you can reach out to me or any member of our staff confidentially, and we may be able to help. It's in that spirit that we're each invited to give. As I invite you to join me in a moment of pastoral prayer, um, you need to know that a Globemaster is one of the military transport planes that we see um, flying over Charleston every day. I invite you to join me in this prayer for peace. To the God, not of the Globemasters, but the people who fly them, we pray for help in bringing them back to earth. Land them safely back home where they belong. May they be grounded here forever. And teach us to imagine a world without war as the old prophets did, our swords turned into plowshares, spears into pruning hooks, our globemasters turned into gardening tools, submarines into solar panels. Help us to honor the soldiers by bringing them home, the mothers by not sacrificing their children, the innocent by safeguarding them, and the earth by protecting it from the plunder of armies and the ruin of bombs. To the God not of the Globemasters, but the people who fly them, help us to live and work for peace. For the ones who fly them, for the ones who fear them, for the ones who look up and see not what is flying in support of our endless wars, but what still could be. A dream of a world where we don't have to study war any more, and the planes can carry food instead of bombs, medicine instead of menace, a garland of flowers to rain down on our friends. We know 
This dream is foolishness to the world. But God help us to be so foolish. And as we pray this, we hold in our prayers the many joys and concerns of our lives. And we hold in our prayers all who are grieving, all who are sick, all who struggle with addiction and the ones who are in recovery, all who are lonely, all the world's peacemakers, and everyone who now works on behalf of the earth in a time of changing climate. We offer all these prayers for peace. In the name of Jesus, whose way sounded foolish at first, but made more sense with every step. We remember him as we join together in the prayer he taught us. One of the hallmarks of the liberal religious tradition is the practice of the open table. We say that this communion table does not belong to us. This communion table belongs to everybody. And everybody is welcome here. So let's make it plain. This table is for all people. People of all ages are welcome here. People of all Gender identities and expressions are welcome here. People of all sexual orientations are welcome here. People of all races and ethnicities, all cultures and backgrounds, people of all nations are welcome at this table. And we gather around it in a spirit of inclusion and love. Friends, if you'd like to join us in this ritual meal, you are welcome to do so. And having said that, I'd like to give you a moment to pause this video if you need to and collect some elements that you may use. Oftentimes in church, we use wine or juice and also bread or sometimes gluten-free crackers. Uh, but you can use anything you have on hand, perhaps those elements or perhaps a cup of coffee and a sweet roll or maybe even in the spirit of this morning's story, a cold bottle of water. Whatever you have on hand will do. We remember that Jesus and his followers improvised with what they had. 
So I'll give you a moment to pause this, collect what you need, and then we'll say a brief prayer and share the communion meal. So now that we've gathered our elements, let's say a prayer of blessing. God, whose name is love, we ask a blessing on all these elements and on all who share them. Show us the way of love in our own lives and show us what we may do for peace. It's in your name we pray, amen. As we take the bread, we remember a time that Jesus gathered with his friends and students and they were sharing a Passover meal. And Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and gave it to them saying, take this, it is myself that I give to you. Friends, as we eat it, let us give thanks for the life that he lived and the love that he gave. And then we take our juice or wine or our drink and we remember that at the same meal, Jesus poured a cup of wine. And after giving thanks for it, he offered it to them saying, drink of this, all of you. This is the cup of our covenant together. It's poured out that we might all become reconciled. Friends, as we drink this, let us give thanks for the lives we are living and let us be sure to spend them in love. Now that we've shared communion, let's take a moment and pass the peace. While we're physically distant, we may do this by texting a word of peace, by whispering a quiet prayer for peace for a friend or for the world, or by finding our own way to pass the peace in this moment. As we do, we remember that Jesus said that the peace he gave was not the same as the world's peace. We remember what we've often said at Circular, that the peace of Christ isn't really an easy peace or an insignificant peace or a half-hearted peace, but it's the peace that truly comes when we put the teachings into practice and see that every person is a member of our family and the earth is our true home. In that spirit, friends, let's pass a word of peace together. <laughs>